Hello and welcome to an overview of rescue task force maneuvers with law enforcement. Oakway, or Mabus 3202, is comprised of 11 township and city full-time career fire departments. Each year, one Oakway fire department takes the lead to organize, design, and deploy a mass casualty incident training event. The 2023 event is scheduled for September 22, 2023, and is being coordinated, planned, and designed by the Waterford Regional Fire Department. In preparation for this event, multiple videos and other training resources have been made available to all Oakway Fire Departments and related emergency services. We will continue to post training videos and information on our YouTube channel at Oakway Training. This two-part presentation is hosted by Jeff Lassers from the West Bloomfield Township Fire Department. In the first part, you'll be introduced to Lieutenant Don Lyons and Firefighter Paramedic Eric McLean from the Waterford Regional Fire Department, as well as Sergeant Dan Himmelspach from the Waterford Police Department. In the second part, you'll be introduced to Brendan Brosnan, who is the Waterford Township Emergency Response Manager, as well as a retired police officer with over 30 years experience. During this video, our guests will help us appreciate the value of quick, efficient, and effective RTF teams. Then they will define and describe the cold, warm, and hot zones at active assailant incidents. Finally, our guests will discuss the value of communication at active assailant events. Lions. Good morning. Hi, buddy. Hi. How you doing? Good. You? I'm fantastic. Why don't you kick us off, tell everybody who you are, what you do, and where you do it. Hello, my name is Don Lyons. I am a lieutenant paramedic for Waterford Regional Fire. I've been with the department for going on 14. I'm in my 14th year, and I'm also the team lead for Rescue Task Force. Right on. Team lead right here at Waterford Regional. And how long have you been teaching the RTF stuff? About eight years now. It's been a long process and a lot of moving parts, but I feel like it's finally coming together. Yeah, well. if it takes a long time, you're probably doing it right because you didn't quit and it moves incrementally. Absolutely. Eric, you've been helping out Don. Who are you, what do you do, and where do you do it? Morning, Jeff. I'm Eric McLean, a firefighter paramedic here at Waterford Regional. Been here just about 10 years. Formerly an EMT instructor here at Waterford, and uh, pretty much ride the box every day. Um, just here to help out as much as I can. Been helping Lieutenant Lyons out the last five, six years with getting this going. Just rolling out training for our department. Now we'll be rolling out training for the rest of Oakway. So just like me, your guy who goes on calls on his shifts, and then you do some training on the side. I'm just a grunt. All right. Cops are here. All right. What about um, you, bud? Dan Hummelspa. I work for Waterford Township Police Department. Been there 24 years. In my spare time, I have assisted the Waterford Regional Fire Department in training their entire department for a rescue task force. I also uh, work outside with Oak Tech where we train every officer in Oakland County on active shooter response from rescue task force scenarios to rescue team scenarios, which are different. Also work with uh, Ford Observation Group outside, which is consisted of uh, a lot of DOD members, military personnel, and myself. Right on. So, so you got some experience doing this? A little bit, yes. You're not just writing tickets all day? No, not anymore. So it takes a team between law enforcement and fire and EMS to kind of make an RTF team happen. So, Lyons, why is it so important that our RTF teams can maneuver quickly, efficiently, and effectively through buildings and obstacles during these active assailant events? Well, a lot of it has to do with the fact that we'll be moving with PD and following their movements. And a lot of the time, it's confusing. You're hooking up with someone you don't know. PD will be escorting us into the building and... The faster we get in there, the faster we can get to the wounded and critically injured and get them to a safe position, safe place where we can treat them. Yeah, it seems like the quicker we're all on the same page, because like you said, you're going to meet up with people you may or may not know. We're all dressed the same, so people think we all know each other. Right. I can't tell you right. how many times my mom will call me and say, hey, did you see that those guys in Toledo, what they did? Do you know them? Right. No, right. I don't know every person that puts a uniform on like me. Were you on that fire in Toledo? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. The point being is that when you hook up with somebody, you kind of need to be on the same page on what we're going to go do, terminology, when, how, and all that stuff. So increased safety, increased patient survival, obviously. From the law enforcement aspect, what else can you add to that of why it's so important to be that efficient and effective team? Well, from a law enforcement perspective, you know, I, I when I train officers, you know, my biggest thing getting across to them is our number one job in a rescue task force is the safety of the medical personnel. At the end of the day, the overall goal is to treat victims 
clear the scene of the assailant, but my main priority is making sure that my fire personnel and medical personnel are safe throughout the entire incident, whether we're going into a cold zone or a warm zone. I only care about them. There is a transfer of power where each unit has to listen to the other, meaning police gets fired to where they need to be, and then fire kind of takes over that pseudo uh, command where they're doing their job treating a victim and then giving it back to PD to get the fire personnel with the victim if if they extricate into a, a cold zone. It's a lot of give and take. It's not who who's the boss. It's working together. Right. There's going to be a lot of expansion, contraction, a lot of changes at the time. So we all got to have this like operational expectation to kind of give and take in our situations to make sure we have that optimized approach. Yeah. It's, it's really being about switched on during the whole incident, you know, both sets of police and medical and listening to the communication. Because if you go into a warm zone and your assailant is fluid throughout a scene and he comes into our scene and now our warm zone just became a hot zone communication has to be on point police definitely need to get you know the fire to safety whether that be into a room or out of the entire zone itself so communication is very important especially knowing the correct words when they are saying smother or we have contact multiple departments use multiple terminology and that's what we're trying to touch on here at this point yeah and then we're trying to all get on the same page and speaking of which eric so before we get into the language and that in the zones and stuff like that Let's break down to what an RTF team really is. Can you define an RTF team in our terms? Yeah, so uh, RTF team is basically a force-protected team of uh, police and fire personnel. It can be EMS providers at any level. Currently, we recommend two police officers and two EMS providers making up a team minimally. Our SOG here in Waterford is for five, but again, that's an SOG. That's a guideline. Realistically, five is going to be tough. We're more likely to have four-person teams, two officers, two EMS providers. Yeah, especially how we staff our stations. We tend to have the, the that schmattering a little bit more effectively available. So I totally get it. Absolutely. Okay, so that tells us what our teams are. So it is a combination of law enforcement and fire EMS or just EMS because what we're going in there to do is not put out fires, but we are going to be treating patients, but we are all paramedics as well. So while I got you, Eric, those teams are going to operate in zones, Let's define the three different zones that are there, and then let's kind of hit on what we do and don't do in those zones. Sure. So anybody that's taken hazmat courses, fire academy, or is familiar with ICS structures has heard these terms. That's kind of why RTF fits neatly into this. So we have hot zones, warm zones, and cold zones. And this can all be flexible, changing, depending on the location, if we're in a single building or a larger, like a college campus. Technically, a hot zone would be where there's contact occurring, where Our best intel is telling us the bad guy is. They're shooting at this location. This is a non-secure location at this time, to the best of our intel. This will be a zone where only law enforcement will be operating by sending in their contact teams to neutralize that assailant or execute that threat. Then moving down, we have warm zones. That's where RTF operates. Again, going off intel, this is going to be a location where we're known to have patients. Leading contact teams are coming across patients and alerting unified command to the location of these patients. So this is where RTF wants to make entry and do the most good for the most people and start treating and extracting. Stepping down one from there, we have our cold zone, and this is a secure area that we can operate in. We can begin staging. We can begin building more RTF teams treating patients and setting up casualty collection points. And some of this will have to get into terminology as far as clear versus secure, cover versus concealment, but a cold zone should be secured and providing cover and concealment. Eric gave us a really good overview of a cold, warm, and hot zone from a firefighter's perspective. It's really clear to us what those are. Who determines what that is? Like literally at the end of the day, is it fire or police that says this is warm, this is hot, this is cold? It's actually a combination of both. Police is going to deal with the actual active shooter assailant themselves. All their intel is going to be geared towards trying to neutralize the assailant. So throughout that process, it kind of reveals itself where we are going to declare cold, warm, and hot. Absolutely, based off of the intel. It molds itself. Every time you get a new piece of intel, it's giving you more clarity on where that line of demarcation between the zones are. Yes. Being that most active shooters, it's a fluid scene. They're on the move unless they are barricaded or something like that. That information, like I had said, stated earlier, 
will be transferred to an incident command post, wherever that it may be on site, it may be just off site. In the incident command, you're going to have law enforcement. You may have our emergency manager in there. Uh, you're definitely going to have fire personnel also. All of them will communicate amongst themselves and then start planning for action disseminating who's going to go where, what teams are going to go where. Are you going to have, you know, contact teams? Are you going to have a rescue task force enter on this side of the building? Whatever that case may be based off the intel. So that intel then gets communicated from a unified command structure to us via radio. That is correct. Who's on the radio? Is it PD who's holding the gun and heading the radio, or is it like me in the middle with my bags? (laughs) It's going to be chaotic. There's no perfect answer. I know earlier we had talked about what a great job, you know, Lansing did in their public safety with the unfortunate incident of the active shooter they had over a week ago. I listened to it live, and they were amazing. There's always hiccups. There's always everybody's wanting to get on the radio. That's going to happen. We as professionals have to fight through that. It could be PD that demands the radio because they could be engaged in an actual shootout at that moment, but then it could transfer over to fire because, hey, we've got six victims in the 300 hall. Pretty important information. So we have to direct rescue task force teams into the 300 hall with police and fire. So it's it's not so much I'm getting the radio. It's about working together as, as a unit. You really made it very clear on the decisions are really made of what we do, when we do it, and how we do it based on the intelligence we receive, not just like, you know, in fire, we call it the art of reading smoke. We look at a building, we can kind of gauge what's going on. Is it too hot to go in? You don't have that looking at an active shooter. It doesn't puff smoke. No. You don't have a clue what's going on. But when we do go in there, it is based on intelligence. And then the last big point, uh, Eric and Don, what point is there like a, Rule of thumb, and when I leave, other than when they tell me to leave? Basically, you're going to continue to treat and triage every patient that you come across until you run out of equipment. And we only have X amount of bandaging, tourniquet supplies, triage tags, and getting back to unified command, letting these people know so we can have other RTF teams lined up to bring our possible casualties or the wounded out. I would just add to that... um that, you know, clearly defined roles ahead of time are, would be very helpful for, you know, who is team leader, who's who's going to be on the radio. And calling for, you know, we call it a PAR. I don't know if a law enforcement uses that term, but it's personnel accountability report. So if we do make contact with a, a bad guy, law enforcement's going to do their thing, but then we need to let command know that we have full accountability of our team, where we're at, and uh, let command know when we're making entry and when we're leaving as well. It's all about communication. You know, you train and train and train for the unfortunate, right? Hopefully it never comes in our, our careers. And nothing ever goes to plan. Always, right. that's why you train, right? For the contingency plans is why we train. Because we could have an incident and then WB's definitely showing up, especially with something of that magnitude, White Lake's going to show up. We have to all be on the same page. That's why it's important for an Oakway, for an Oak Tech, because we don't train I don't train with WB outside, you know, Waterford and WB don't do joint training. Right. You know, I we think get the that. Clearly defined communication lines as far as oh, radio absolutely. channels. That's been an issue in the past and we've obviously gotten better with it. And I feel like we're moving forward in the right direction by doing these videos. Absolutely. Agreed. Yeah. So I, I appreciate you guys sitting down with me and uh, we're going to turn this into something cool. Hey, Brendan. Hey. Who are you? What are you doing? Where do you do it? So my name is Brendan Brosnan. Currently, I'm the emergency manager for Waterford Township. I'm also in charge of all the officers' tactical training and all their firearms training. Prior to that, I did uh, 26 years in Warren. My last 20 uh, was with SWAT. I was team leader. Uh, I was a sniper. At one point, I was a range master for half a dozen years. So I was a senior firearms instructor. I was also the emergency manager at one time there. And then uh, prior to that, I was with the Wayne County Sheriff's Department. So right on, you got a nice long history of uh, catching bad guys and at least in high tactical situations, which translates nicely to the RTF situation we're talking about here today. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. So um, I've been in law enforcement for about 30 years. And when you consider everything that's happened during that, uh, that time period, you know, it's really interesting at seeing how it evolves. And unfortunately, it evolves every time that we have a significant failure. Yeah. So I remember Columbine. I remember sitting there watching the SWAT guys arrive and the patrolmen arrive, and they're trying to signal guys to get people to get out of the uh, windows, but nobody's forcing entry and hunting people down. And then training sort of evolved from that <clears throat> into what was called like a heavy head, 
diamond formation, hall boss. There's been a lot of significant changes. And along the way, it's always, you know, law enforcement has always made sure that there's been improvements. But the problem, and I think almost where like this RTF has come from, is that if you take like a 30,000 or, you know, 250,000 square foot facility and SWAT officers, patrol officers, they respond to those areas and clear the facilities, typically they continue to clear at least a second time. So your first time through, you're making uh, room entries and you're making sure that uh, you're not seeing anyone right there. You know, you find the guy that's down, but now they end up having to go through the, the facility a second time. And that's almost at a macro level where guys are opening up, you know, like cupboards and making sure people aren't hiding in those areas. Well, where that becomes problematic is people that would have lived had they had treatment are bleeding out. And so now we have rescue task force where it's like, let's get the guys in that have the mass casualty equipment to stop some of these people from, from bleeding out. You know, and then just all the technology advances that we've had from the sandbox overseas. People that would have been dying 10 years ago are surviving these. Officers are carrying quick clot and Israeli pressure dressings, tourniquets, and then fire guys are drilling into people's bones and delivering blood and needed uh, meds to stabilize. It's crazy where it's going. And I, and I don't know when it's gonna, when we're gonna finally get there. We probably never will. I imagine that our tactics are, are going to continue to evolve forever. They should, right? We're always looking to make improvement. But where we are today, as opposed to where we were ten years ago or fifteen years ago, it's insane. So, for instance, Danny Hemelspa and myself, um, since I took this position the last three years ago, we've had like uh, Delta Force and Green Beret guys coming in, some of the best uh, hostage rescue guys on the planet helping us uh, help our officers to make tactical entries into those environments and be as efficient as possible with movement. And um, it makes us quicker and more on point, which makes us better. So Right. You're, you're hitting the nail on the head right there is that we have all these people that can do amazing things if we can get the medics and the EMS providers to the patients. Right. But that all has to do with a big system of communications, getting intelligence, making decisions, and then getting in there. And then the process of physically hut, hut, hut through the building right. has to be massively efficient. If you could give our listeners, before we sign off from you, your recommendations based on all of your history. And the topic we're really talking about here today is the efficiency of movement and maneuvering as a team between law enforcement and that RTF. So what are your takeaways on that? There's actually a lot going on. One of the questions that came up while you guys were talking was about who determines what a hot zone is. And there isn't anyone that's going to be determining what a hot zone is. It's actually going to come down to the officer's goal is to shrink this problem, either contain this person, uh, have them barricade themselves in, and then we're able to come behind and do all the treatment and casualty response that we possibly can, or put so much pressure on him that he smokes himself, which is a fine outcome as well. Or, uh, you know, if the guy, you think you have him cornered and then he goes out through a window, well, now we completely start all over again because now he's fluid and he's moving out in the open. He's in your perimeter. And that happens. The bottom line is this. The most effective first responders, whether it's EMS, fire, police, SWAT, commanders that are running any of those units, you have to be Peyton Manning's linemen. If we go into the huddle and we come up with the best plan, I've, I've come up with great action plans for barricaded gunmen. We've gone through houses uh, that were built by the same builders in the subdivision trying to make the absolute best entry. Everything goes sideways as soon as you have contact. And I think that whatever plan that we come up with, you have to know that when your team leaders or the people that are in there come to contact or come up on that line and they start calling Omaha, 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 because everything's different. The best first responders are ones that can respond to change. We all know people in our lives that as soon as you have a plan and that plan has to be changed, they're immediately overwhelmed and they're not worth a damn to any of us. So don't get stuck in what was initially said. Everything that we do, I don't care what it is, whether it's a responding to an accident or some type of B&E, your response has to be fluid, and you can't cement yourself into what your response is. 